Lu, vim assistir a partida de tênis. Vou falar baixinho. Dolarizei parte da minha carteira de investimento com a Avenue. Agora tem conta nos Estados Unidos e invisto em qualquer ativo lá. Diversificação, moeda forte. Você sabe, né? A ideia é blindar o patrimônio e evoluir. Dá uma olhada. www.avenue.us A partida vai começar. Beijos. Conquiste o green card dos seus investimentos. Avenue. Evolução real em dólar. RH, quer saber como voar no trabalho? É só usar a Flash. Com a Flash, você concentra toda a gestão de pessoas em um único lugar. Faça a admissão dos colaboradores e solicite mais de oito categorias de benefícios. Ah, e você ainda pode fazer todo o controle de ponto. Conheça o novo onboarding integrado da Flash em flashapp.com.br. Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode and I've got a fantastic guest for you today, Anna Yernova, coming from uh, the beautiful country of Germany. And she helps, especially male career people who have been successful previously, pivot, change, navigate the midlife career crisis. We serve similar audiences. She's got a lot of great ideas and views, and I'm really happy to have her on the show. So Anna, welcome. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for a great introduction. I'm really happy to be on your show and talk to your audience. Yeah, to set the stage, we always ask how you got to where you are and how you can help better serve the audience. Yeah, absolutely, sure. I was myself a corporate professional for a very long time, almost 20 years. It's a bit scary to say that. And at some point, I, I hit a wall. I hit a crisis, which I now call mid-career crisis, basically. And I just it just didn't inspire me anymore. I was looking to do something else, something I'd love, but I didn't know how to technically do it because I was in a very highly paid job at the VP level. And I didn't know how to make a pivot in a way that will not be a downshifting. I also had a young family, two young kids. And to add a little bit of spice to my transition, I was happening in the background, against the background of 2008-2009 crisis, Ooh. where I, my family personally lost a lot of saving and my husband almost blocked his business. So I was like, oh my God, this is like the worst possible scenario for career transition. But actually by then, I already tried and failed several times and I had a system that I absolutely believed worked. And I decided, okay, if I'm really serious about making a transition, now is the best time. Because, I mean, if it works now, then I, I want to something really great. And if it doesn't, okay, I'll just blame it on the crisis and go back to work, basically, to nine to five. But it worked. I transitioned from corporate to being a coach. And then I really well, I did it really well. And in a way, got lucky. In a way, I saw that my system worked. And then I worked with a variety of corporate clients and executive clients helping other people be successful. But at some point came to a point of second transition where I had to scale my practice, my coaching practice into something I would call a business, more like a coaching business. And at that point, I started to work with other professionals like coaching, coaches or strategy consultants. And everyone told me the same thing. You have to specialize. You have to specialize. Otherwise, you can't scale. Yeah. And we analyzed basically my clients and turned out that the, the sweet spot were men, majority, like over 80, 90% even of my clients were men. And, and they happened to be in this kind of 35, 55 years of age, age bracket, so to say. And also when I analyzed their requests further, I realized that there was something in common that all of them at some point in this kind of age bracket, they lost their module, they lost maybe the love with their current career, they hit some sort of wall crisis and they wanted an upgrade. Either they wanted a big promotion or they wanted to change industry. Some of them wanted to change geography. They wanted to move to work in another country. Some wanted to leave nine to, nine to five altogether, start their own thing. Some wanted all of them, change geography and the industry and leave nine to five and do their own thing. So I realized that this is a request for change as a response to crisis. And this is how I got very curious and started specializing in that particular niche and also learning about mid-career crisis, mid-life crisis, also what makes it different to men and women and so on. And that's how basically for the last, now it's over a decade, I'm just working with the clientele of mid-career men who want a career upgrade. 
at mid-career and want to have a uh, spectacular second act. Interesting. I, you, there's a lot to pack there because we can talk about the common signs and symptoms, but why I'm curious what, and like I said, the signs and symptoms, but what is the cause of these? Or what is the cause of a midlife crisis? Is it um, discontent? Is it unhappiness? Is it um, societal change? What's underlying? What, what, why do people go through crises? I believe that through any crisis, what it means, especially when we have a, a crisis of human life, right? For instance, people who have kids. Do you have kids, Chris? Yes. Yeah, we have kids. Okay. So we all know that when small kids are small, they go through crisis, right? Like they end like one year, three years, seven years, right? Some, something like that. And every time when they had hit a crisis, it usually has to do with them really making a big upgrade in the life because they've learned so much, they've approached a different level of capability, right? So the previous level, it doesn't satisfy them anymore, and, but yet they don't yet know how to function on, on, on the next level. It's a bit overwhelming, hence the crisis. And I believe that actually, though a lot of people think uh, that mid-career, mid-life crisis is a problem, it is a problem because it's not nice when you hit it, when you lose your inspiration, when you're not looking forward to your day at work, when if things had previously excited you, suddenly that they make no meaning. So it's not fun to be in that sort of state. But actually, we shift our perception saying, actually, it's a sign that there's something more available to this particular man right now. And all the crisis is saying that this man is up for an upgrade. But something needs to change for him to get it. So overall, I'd say the symptoms of a crisis usually tell me that the, the man is somehow at a dead end. The previous career path has ended or ending. And, but usually, to be honest, by the time clients come to me, they, they already been stuck for a while and been suffering for a while. So I'd say that we, we usually discovered that the previous career has ended years ago, but they tried to revive it and, and that created a lot of stuckness. But once they embrace the fact that, okay, one path is ended, I've just completed something. I've completed. It's not because there was a, some, something horrible happened, but I've just completed the mission. Then something, a new path will, will open. And usually this completion actually has to do with a man having fulfilled expectations that he grew up with. That, to put it simply. Because a lot of men, when I, I talk to them about their career, they use a, a lot of shoots. I should do this. I should do that. Yeah, usually I would say mid-career is when men has fulfilled a lot of the shoots and they can actually now be their own man. They can now fulfill the mission of why they're here in the first place, not to just fulfill other people's expectations, but actually leave their own imprint in the world. And uh, when you look at it like that, it's actually very hopeful time in every man's life where you actually have a chance to now uh, create something unique and uh, your own imprint in, in this world. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's just, I think with, um, so a follow-up question to that is, um, in traditionally it was the midlife, um, midlife career, midlife crisis. And now there's a quarter life crisis and then there's a crisis after midlife is like the three quarters. Why are we seeing more frequent crises and more transitions? Uh, I'm curious because I had a midlife crisis when I was 29. Basically, I fulfilled all the shoulds and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do this. I want to lead my own life. Why do people, why is now the emergence of a quarter life crisis? And is it because the world is changing so fast or just? Case? Yeah, that could be one of the cases. I also believe, I actually also had a, a much harder, the 30, 30 year old crisis hit me much harder. And I really had to change a lot of things in my life and I had to release a lot of expectations. And I find that maybe the, a lot of people have uh, cast times at midlife, which I define like 35, 55. So to say roughly, so when you're 45 average, what do you say? A lot of people who have the most difficult time at midlife, it, there is a consequence of them somehow not resolving the previous crisis that you've just mentioned. I bet probably you did some work there as well at 30, or maybe your crisis was at such, so strong that you just could not ignore. It was the same for me. It actually triggered my first career change. Whereas for a lot of guys who come to me with their mid-career crisis, they, are, they talk to me about the 30-year-old crisis, but 
somehow, maybe there were other priorities. Maybe they were getting married and had to provide, which is a reason for a lot of men and actually just ignoring their own discontent, honestly. And that, that were this little voice saying, this is not your path. No. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. But they're taking, they, they then around 30, usually either already accepted or about to accept so many external commitments that they just, they just ignore that voice until it just becomes completely unbearable. And what I said, those who ignore the little voices at around the age of 30, like you described, because I do believe there's crisis there as well. Yeah. They usually have a really hard at around 40 and so on, because it's almost like this little voice is just, I am so fed up, you're ignoring me. And they're just pulling the plug out and the men feel total switch off energy. Yeah, if before they could ignore, they still had the energy, right? But now they just feel that they have to soldier through, push themselves, that they're running out of energy. So it's actually not even an option to go on like that. And the worst thing that, or the best thing, that they still have at least 20 years to go, right? So they, many come and say, I, I pushed myself, I soldiered through for five years, but I can't go like that for 20 years, right? So something has to change. So in a way... To answer your question, I think the old crises are, crises are related and they, they, every next step requires you, the previous starts to be resolved. And if they're not resolved, then they will all be, they will all come knocking on your door together, making it a much bigger change, so to say. Yeah. It's interesting because I was talking with a, another guest as well in, especially around the career finances, relationships, new marriage, kids. Is if you procrastinate on what the, this still small, quiet voice or the intuition or the universe, if you procrastinate and you don't make the decision, then the universe is going to make the decision for you. And it usually comes in the form of a catastrophe or crisis, could be divorce, bankruptcy. Yep. Yeah. Healthcare often. Yes. True. Oh. Big loss. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yes. Yes. I see. And, and it's repeating story in my clients' cases as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Another question I have for you is what's the difference between midlife crisis and burnout? Like what, what, how, how are those two related? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd put it this way. Burnout is a big symptom of a midlife crisis. The, the way that the, I see the difference, if you, because burnout may not, may have other reasons as well. You're simply not taking enough breaks. Sometimes people are actually so in love with what they do that they neglect that their bodily needs of rest or food or something. They could be obsessed with what they're doing, right? So they're happy. With what they're doing, they, it's not that they hate their work or they they soldier through okay. it, but they just they just get too tired, right? They just exhaust their resources and they need uh, a rest. But usually, in this case, when they have rested, they're looking forward to go back to work and then they back to normal. So to say, of course, they have to watch the maybe work life balance. They have to watch the workouts, but usually they're looking forward to going back to work after the rest. People who, for whom this burnout is already a symptom of, of a bigger change required, which a lot of men have burnout as a symptom at, at midlife crisis. I guess midlife crisis is not the only time when burnout can happen, but at least that. The, one of the like really big signs is that men go on holidays, but the closer and then they can spend a week, two weeks, a month. Some men take a year off, they go, they go on sabbatical, but the moment the, the thought of going back to work approaches, they hate it. Okay. it. It just gets them depressed, right? Every time they imagine that they're back doing what they were doing, it becomes unbearable to the point, Chris, that men actually start having fantasies about escaping, just like pretending they that had a boating accident and, and they were dead and then emerging, re-emerging somewhere in a faraway land. Literally, a lot of men have said fantasies of active suicide and things like that just because they don't know how to basically it's escape fantasies right but they don't know how to escape but that's how they hate going back to work and now when that happens after you've taken your rest and you've slept through your tiredness and you've had some fun and doing something else and that actually creates even bigger hate for, for your war going back dread bigger dread i would say going back to work, then it's a sign that you had the wrong job and the wrong career. But it's actually sucking your life out of you, right? Um, and that, uh, that is how I would, I would see the difference between a burnout and a, and a career burnout that actually is a more sign of a crisis and that you really need to find something else to do. 
Yeah. Interesting. And moving on, because I know we have a couple more minutes. The other, so you talk about, you have this five, you use the five set system to help clients navigate their career changes, walk us through these steps and and then we'll end it with, you know, how people can find you and, and contact you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That, well, okay. These five steps is actually exactly like when I mentioned to you that I've developed my own system, how to shift careers. And then I decided when I was like about to shift my own career, uh, 2008, whether I should do it or not. And then I thought, okay, this is the system. I'm going to try it if it works. So since then it's been working for me and for my clients. So that uh, step number one is that it's actually finding your why we, you would be working in the first place. Because a lot of people say they work for money, which is not true. Money is a consequence of you creating value with your work, right? But you really have to find a, a high purpose. And I know purpose is a scary word because everyone is using it. And what is this? But I define purpose in a simple terms. When you're on purpose, when you feel actually that it's natural to you, you enjoy what you're doing and the most important sign that energizes you. The activity you're involved in energizes you. This is the number one sign that you're on purpose. And even if they stop paying you and you had absolutely, you won the lottery, never had to work again, and that activity would present itself, you'd still enjoy doing it. Yeah. So that's something purposeful that, that actually energizes you. And believe it or not, a lot of men I work with and are very accomplished and they have a great career. They have no idea what the purpose is. They have no idea why they're here in the first place. And I actually take them through the process of a methodology to find what's, why are they here? Basically, what are their gifts and how they're supposed to share them with the world? So that's a step number one, because that plugs you into the, let's say, energy that prevents burnout, actually makes your life fun while you're making money. Second step is uh, one, once you know why you're here and what you really love doing and what you really want to be doing for the rest of your career, then the second step is to claim your gift and worth because a lot of men actually have an idea of what they'd like to do, but they tell, talk themselves out of it saying they don't have the right degree, they don't have the right qualifications, whatever. So the good news for mid-career is that you already have more than enough. It's just about claiming your skills, your gifts, your experiences in the right way, and also presenting, let's say, the skill sets to yourself and others in the right way. So it will be deconstructing your previous experiences and then putting those pieces together in a way that you see you have everything you need to actually jumpstart your new path, whatever you chose it to be, right? So that's the second step. And then third step is also very important because I call it identity shit because a lot of people have this belief, false belief, for instance, oh, in order to be a writer, I have to write a bestseller. Then I'm a writer, right? If I'm, I haven't written a bestseller, I'm not a writer. But the problem is you will never write anything unless you actually become a writer. That's a paradox. You cannot actually write anything worthy without getting into the identity of being a writer, because then who, who is right doing the writing, right? And then that's a kind of trick about that you need to actually shift your identity and put on the values, the mindset, and, the, and the, let's say the worldview of the identity that you want to become before you actually fully be become it, so to say, before, let's say, your accomplishments will approve, to, uh, let's say, to you that you are a writer, right? So first you need to become a writer. Then write a bestseller. That's this sort of the sequence here. Yeah, and that's what I'm helping guys to do to create this identity shift. In a way, again, there's a method that helps you do that. When you are experimenting in the right way and you do the identity shift and then already you make it happen in, in the external world. So that's a step number three. And step number four is also very important. And many people know what it's all about. It's about networks and how you use your memberships and also the networks, collective experiences, uh, who do you know, what are the kind of people you connect with. But a lot of people uh, use these networks in a very wrong way when they go into a career transition. There is a certain way how you need to use your network, which is differently to how you would usually use them. And I explain that it, it in my step fourth. To put it simply, I will not be able to share everything here, simply that you really have to make a very conscious effort to shift your networks to with those people who will be already connected to your new identity, right? Let's say you were a doctor and now you will want to be an entrepreneur. It's really important for you to connect to other entrepreneurs. 
because so that you see the world as an entrepreneur and you understand how entrepreneurs look at things, how they solve problems, what do they do? It becomes normal to you because if you would connect to other doctors and talk who want to be as who aspire to be entrepreneurs, then all you will ever be, you will be a doctor aspiring to be an entrepreneur and they will in fact could actually jeopardize your move because they will be sharing all the obstacles and biases. Whereas when you connect to people who's already on the other side of your change, who already made it happen, it, it becomes a bridge, so to say, that really helps you navigate the gap that, that you need to. So that's the fourth step. And the fifth step is actually probably needs to be number one. <laughs> this is about asking for help. Because a lot of men hate, successful men hate asking for help. They have almost shame connected to being vulnerable, asking for help. And to be honest, I, I don't know, Chris, what's your experience, but people in helping professions like doctors or therapists or coaches, they are the worst actually going to other doctors. Yes. The, uh, they usually try to treat themselves, treat themselves. And that's a big mistake when it comes to career change. So actually witnessing your own vulnerability, seeking external help is very important. That's the step five. And the easiest thing for, for, for your listeners would be, I put it all together. There's like a free masterclass training slash training I put together and they can just simply go to my website and watch it and see if that it resonates for them. Como bombar a sua marca no TikTok? A gente aqui do TikTok for Business te conta todos os segredos aqui no nosso podcast, o Videocast for You. Tem muito case de sucesso para te inspirar, dicas de como bombar suas campanhas na plataforma e ainda muitos insights com grandes nomes do mercado da publicidade para sua estratégia de branding e vendas. Também ser hit no TikTok e com a sua audiência. Vem ouvir o podcast For You do TikTok aqui mesmo no Spotify. Desde 2019, a Toyota vem acelerando o futuro, produzindo no Brasil o primeiro híbrido flex do mundo. De lá para cá, as coisas mudaram. Muitos entraram na tendência que a gente criou. Mas sabe o que não mudou? A confiança do brasileiro na Toyota, que não veio da noite pro dia. Toyota, no futuro há muito tempo. Paz no trânsito começa por você. Yeah, really uh, interesting because I, I really love this idea because, you know, when I was transitioning from physician to entrepreneur, I basically um, cut off all my ties because they were all saying, you're not going to make it, but you're making a stupid decision. And I was just like, so I just plugged myself into people that were successful in doing the things that I wanted to do. Um, the other, yeah, I know, I, I know we have a couple of few minutes left and what is this idea of future trends in career development and what trends do you see for mid-career professionals? Are you going to see more midlife crises? Because now these days it's more and more acceptable to do your own thing. And I, a lot of kids are not, they think college is a waste of time and they want to really pursue their passions and they don't want to get into excessive debt. Are you going to see less of a mid-career transition or are you going to see a phasing out like the older generation going through this and like the younger generation care? They're like, I know what I want. I, I don't have to go through this. What do you see? I hope we'll see less of prices. I honestly believe that even for our generation, generation X, so to say, Midlife crisis is a, is a little bit like a legacy thing. Because basically, we already know. I remember when I was just starting my career, I already, and I was getting my degrees, I already knew that I would have to change careers because the career for life was no, no longer available to our generation. So it's interesting that, that uh, and yet when people hit brick walls somewhere in 10 years into their career, 15 years into their career, it comes as a shock. Even though everybody knows and reads that, there is no career for life. There's like portfolio careers. You'll have to change careers. And still somehow, I guess it's because we have the role models of our parents and that generation. And we were brought up, right? Our teachers, our therapists, I don't know, our doctors, everyone that come of that generation would tell us how to live our life, what should happen to us, right? So it's like a, so it's dissonance, like cognitive dissonance. We know, but what, uh, we, we expect something else happening. So I believe the more we normalize that you will have multiple careers during your life's working life, the, and the more we actually teach people the skill of puberty, the skill of knowing how to navigate those changes, the more it will become norm, the, the less it will be a crisis, I believe. That's number one. Second, I believe right now, new generation, I already have millennials as clients. 
unfortunately, they skip some prizes as well. But I believe the more younger generations seek to not just work for money, but also do things that give them fun, give them joy, be also, or there's a lot of opportunities, of course, now with online, the technology, with everything, where you can try so many different things rather than just sitting in your box in the nine to five, right? That people will just be exposed to a lot more and there will be a lot more opportunities to select, the, let's say, money-making mechanism that fit to who you are, to your natural abilities and so on. Having said that, I still think, Chris, that Conflict between expectations and becoming your own person, our own person, will exist, right? Maybe the crisis will become younger. That could happen, right? People will have crisis early and then they will have it. But then I think they maybe will have a second act, but then maybe they have another crisis, have a third act. Because I also believe we will be talking less about kind of career retirement. People will maybe work longer. But maybe they'll have more breaks, sabbaticals, or flexible working arrangements because I see a lot of that. And finally, what I want to say, I see a lot of, and I see read recently, a lot of people going solo, so solopreneurs or different projects or doing side hustles in, in addition to, to, let's say, their corporate careers because people feel that there is, but they want to express themselves in a, in a different way. So I don't think we will continue to see that there are no crises at all, but I think there will be just maybe different shapes and we will be more conscious and maybe less terrifying by hitting the crisis. It will be just seen as growth, natural process. Yeah. Yeah. I think Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they, they really get it and they're gonna, I think uh, it's interesting because they'll, they'll pay double for a product or service if it aligns with their values and they, they really understand the Gen X and we got, we got, we got smashed in the middle with the mm-hmm. industrial and then with the information revolution. But yeah, how can people find you and follow your socials? They are very enthusiastic and passionate. And I know you love helping entrepreneurs in this area and how can they do that? Yeah, sure. Listen, the easiest way to get in touch with me is by my website, which is on our robot, my name.com on our robot. And there you can see this first uh, free training, just hit free training where I share my masterclass. It's only like 40, 45 minutes, but you can really check your symptoms, go through the five shifts that I'm sharing and already learn a lot. And if that resonates, you can even go one step further and book a free call with me. If you're in that mid-career range and if you're a man and, and you feel like this resonates and bring your question to the call, I will, I would just look at your particular situation and I will honestly answer those questions. And honestly, this 45 minutes that guys spend with me on this call, sometimes are life changing. I wouldn't say every call, but there a lot of guys tell me I've never spoken to this to, to anyone, even my wife, even my therapist don't know. And thanks very much for validating what I'm going through. And a lot already, you know, leave the call with a solution. So yeah, why not give, give yeah. yourself a, a chance there. <laughs> Yeah. What, one final uh, follow-up is just out of my curiosity, are you seeing a lot of your clients more from the West or Europe? Because I know there's cultural differences and are you seeing it or your clients are more European or I'm just for my own? I have American clients. I have European clients. I have a lot of clients, for instance, from Middle East where a lot of expatriates work in Middle East. And of course, they, the careers are very important because the families usually travel with them and they're dependent on, on the income. Yeah. I, I would say that I would say uh, often, for instance, when I, I have clients from North America, it's usually people who maybe need a different look, maybe they feel, for instance, I had guys from army, the Amer- Americans in the army about to retire and they felt that retire from the army, which means that I can the 45, 46 and had no, having no idea where to go next and really wanted like outside perspective a little bit outside maybe of the system where they, where they operate. Yeah. Yeah. But I do work well with Americans and most of my clients come US, Europe and Middle East, basically expats from Europe or America who work in the Middle East. That, that's what I would say my, most of my clients come from. Interesting. Yeah. I really enjoyed this conversation and for the audience, be sure to check out Anna's uh, socials and give her a like and follow, reach out to her for a, a consultation. And thanks so much for coming on. Thanks very much for having me. And by the way, congratulations for having over a thousand shows. That, uh, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> yeah. Podcast. Thanks I appreciate so it. Thank you.